Good morning. It is Tuesday, September 13, 2022, and I'm Kenny Polkar, your host of the party, and today is CPI Day. So here are the things that we need to know to get your day started, right? Investors are preparing for a better CPI, right? We're expecting it to be better. That's known it's priced in. But don't expect that this is going to change the Fed's narrative, right? Because I don't believe it's going to. They've made it very clear. Goldman Sachs announced that they're about to lay off hundreds of employees starting today. Oh, boy, what does this mean? Oil is up. The dollar is down. Treasuries remain inverted. And what do we have for dinner today? We're going to have the fettuccine with butter and sweet cherry tomatoes. Oh, my God. Simple to make, but so good. You'll never understand how you lived without it. All right, so stocks continue to extend the gains, right, that they've been building over the past couple of weeks as the speculation builds that inflation has peaked or that it's starting to roll over and die, which I don't think it is, but that's all another conversation. Speculation that I think is way too optimistic, but we'll get back to that in a little bit. By the end of the day yesterday, the Dow added 230 points, seven tenths of a percent. The S&P up 45 points or 1%. The NASDAQ gaining 155 points or 1.3%. The Russell added 25 points or 1.2%. And the transports gained 200 points or 1.4%. Every sector in the 11 major S&P sectors was once again in the green. Tech and energy leading the way. Both sectors up nearly 1.7%. Healthcare up 1.7%. Consumer discretionary up 1.3%. Real estate, utilities, and basic materials were up next. They were up just under 1%. And carrying up the rear were the industrials, financials, consumer staples, and communications, all rising about a half a percent. The contra trades, as expected, have been under pressure as stocks surge, right? But before you go giving up on them, remember, these ETFs are not meant to be an investment. You don't buy the PSQ or the DOG or the SH to own them. You don't buy the SPXS, which is a triple levered as it be short to own it, you use these ETFs strategically. You buy them to hedge yourself against what you think is coming weakness, if you believe the weakness is coming. And then you close out the position when you think it's over. Unlike the way you buy, say, Apple. You keep buying Apple. You keep reinvesting the dividends and then you buy more Apple. That's not strategic, that's smart investing. Yesterday, we also heard that Goldman Sachs is prepared to lay off hundreds of workers starting as early as today, citing a slowing economic environment and tougher times ahead for big investment banks. Estimates suggesting that Goldman Sachs will suffer a 40% decline in earnings this year. Now the question is, are the others going to follow suit? Think J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Wells Fargo, Citibank. I'm thinking you guys should get back to the office. That's what I think. I'm not sure what you're waiting for, but if I were you, I'd get, be getting back to my desk, you know, turning on my computer, letting people see me. It's a whole nother story. Anyway, next up today at 8.30, we're about to get the latest read on U.S. inflation. The August CPI read, and as I've been telling you, it's expected to be down it's expected to come in at 8% year over year, down from 85 That's great. But we should all take note that CPI X food and energy year over year is expected to rise to 6.1% up from 58 And that's the conundrum. With inflation still at 8 plus percent and interest rates at 3 to 3 and a quarter as of next Wednesday, many are still asking how far does the Fed have to take interest rates to make sure that they kill the monster? History tells us that the Fed has to take interest rates above inflation rates, right? So if that's the case, we have plenty of room to go. Which causes me to ask, why does anyone think that the Fed is prepared to pivot? It's not like we're in a recession, right? They keep telling us, we're not in a recession. Don't anyone worry about it. It's all good. So then they should be able to continue to raise rates. Now, unless we see inflation completely retreat, by the year end 2022, I just don't see how the Fed can justify doing nothing in the new year. Because we're still expecting a 50 basis point increase in November, a 25 basis point hike in December, and that gets us to the 375, 4% range by year end. But that's still a good 3 to 4% away from inflation which means we can expect continued increases into the new year. Remember what Kansas City S. And George said on Friday. There is a clear-cut case for continuing to remove monetary support. Now, to be fair, she didn't de define the time frame. 
She deliberately left it open, but that's a strategy play. And don't forget, the Fed is also supposed to be reducing the balance sheet by uh, $90 billion a month starting this month. And no one really knows how the economy or the markets are going to respond. So everyone's a little bit on edge about that. But that should not uh, play into what the Fed should do with monetary policy. Next up are the earnings. I remain cautious about the coming earnings season. And then what happens when we actually get the earnings? Will they disappoint even the downward revised estimates? In any event, I would not be surprised to once again see us test lower again before it stabilizes, which only means you need to stay focused and keep putting money away. Hold it in cash if you're nervous, but get your shopping list ready. Remember, you're never going to pick the absolute bottom, just like you're never going to pick the absolute top. But you can stay in the game and should stay in the game to build for the long-term future, right? That's what it's about. You're not a day trader in your investment in your retirement account. It's not a day trading account. Oil, yep, that continues to rally. It's up a dollar twenty. It was up a dollar twenty-seven yesterday to eighty-eight oh six a barrel. It's now up nine percent in the last four trading days, leaving it just shy of the trend line eighty-nine forty-two. This morning we're seeing it up again. It's up a bucket eighty-eight seventy-three as it prepares to challenge that resistance. U.S. futures are up again this morning, right? As we wait for the clock to tick to eight thirty. The Dow's up 116, Dow futures, the S&P futures up 16, the Nasdaq's up 45, the Russell's up 7. Traders and investors are betting that inflation has peaked or is near peaking, and that has ignited the debate about what's next. A weakening CPI is causing many to suggest that the Fed will pivot early next year, while others say, uh-uh-uh, not until the Fed sees evidence of a sustained slowdown in inflation. Sustained means more than one month, Right? And it's all systems go, as far as the Fed's concerned, keeping up their very hawkish commentary, right? I don't see them pivoting, and I see them maintaining a very uh, rigid focus. Tomorrow brings us to PPI report, and we all know what that means. Expectations call for the PPI to also decline, and that decline will be reflected in next month's CPI, as it takes three to four weeks for prices at the producer level to be reflected in the consumer level. Later this week, we're also going to get retail sales of 0%, right? But X autos and gas are expected to be up a half a percent. Look for industrial production of one ten, up one-tenth of a percent. Capacity utilization of 80.3%, which is in line with last month. But remember, capacity utilization greater than 80 suggests that inflationary pressures remain alive and well. And then on Friday, we'll get the University of Michigan Sentiment Survey expectation of 60, which is an improvement over last month. And one-year inflation forecasts have uh, inflation running at 4.6%. So there is some, you know, excitement about falling inflation. But until you see that sustained move, uh, you shouldn't get too, too worked up yet. European markets are all a bit higher. Markets across the region up about four-tenths of a percent. UK unemployment fell to 3.6%, a level not seen in that country since 1974. Wage growth fell by 2.8%. That's not good. While Bank of England uh, Governor Andrew Bailey is hoping that employers control wage growth so they don't add to inflationary pressures. This, though, is sure to create broad discontent amongst workers, causing strikes in the public square, right? The S&P gapped up on the opening yesterday, traded as high as 41.19 and as low as 40 uh, and as low as 4,083, right, which was the opening. It ended the day at 41.10, up 45 points. We're now solidly in the 40.27, 42.70 trading range. Notice the numbers: 4.02 and 7, just all mixed up. With futures high this morning, we can expect that they want to test 4,200 on the S&P. And while that won't happen today. If today's CPI and tomorrow's PPI reports are as expected, then I would guess a test of 4,200 is not far away. In fact, we might even get there by Thursday. While I'm bullish on today's report, I remain cautious about the coming earnings. Is the Goldman News just the beginning of a round of layoffs in the financial services sector? We know that many of the tech companies are, are slowing down or pulling back from hiring. They told us that during the earnings season. And as the year ends and third quarter earnings are about to begin, this is the time of year when we begin to see companies prepare for 2023, where they, you know, announce their layoffs and they, ref and they reformat. It happens every year. In any event, I would not be surprised to see us test lower again before this stabilizes. Maybe a test will only be the lows of September, right? 39, 30-ish. If earnings are not as weak as some expect. If by chance they are weaker... Then a retest of the June lows, 36.50, is not out of the question. 
which only means you need to stay focused. You need to keep putting money away. You need to hold it in cash if you're nervous, right? But be ready. You know how I am. I'm always kind of constantly investing, right? Because it is a long-term account. Remember, in an environment like this, I'm going to say it again, big and boring names in a nervous environment are beautiful and they offer shelter in the storm. So focus on the good, the solid U.S. mega cap names that are good divvy payers and then take advantage of the weaker prices, right? Sectors, again, to be overweight in, no matter who you are, would be energy, healthcare, utilities, consumer staples for sure. That doesn't mean you eliminate everything else. That just means you're overweight. But you have to balance that with who you are, right, in your life cycle. Younger, you want to take on more risk. Older, you want to take on a little bit less risk. Okay, so what are we having for dinner today? This is so simple, and you'll wonder how you ever lived without it. It's fettuccine with butter and sweet cherry tomatoes and, and onion and fresh grated parmesan cheese. It's simple. It's not really any more uh, difficult than that. So you need that. Plus, you need um, uh, chopped parsley, chopped basil, and, of course, you need the fresh grated parmesan cheese, right? You need, like, three pints of cherry tomatoes. Now, you're going to bring a pot of salted water to a rolling boil and then turn it down to simmer on the back burner just so it's ready when you need it. You're not wasting another 10 minutes. While that's happening, you want to take the tomatoes, little cherry tomatoes, slice them in half. And then you want to dice your onion. You don't want to chop the onion. You want to dice it, right? Now, in a large saute pan that's going to accommodate all the ingredients, you want to start by taking the stick of butter and melting it in the pan. Put it on medium high. Don't burn it. And while the butter is melting, now you want to add in the diced onion and saute it until it's soft, right? It'll get all, uh, uh, it'll melt, you know, it'll come together with the melted butter. Saute it for five minutes. So now add in the cherry tomatoes, which you've sliced in half. Leave the heat on medium high and let them cook for about 20 minutes. You want to stay close. You need to stir so that they don't burn. In about 15 minutes, they're going to start to break down and become soft. Use the back of the wooden spoon to smash some of them while leaving the others intact. Now turn the heat up on the pot of water and add in the fettuccine. Cook it until it's al dente. Fettuccine will take about 10 minutes, but you want to leave it just undercooked because it's going to continue to cook in the saute pan once you mix it. Now, after you get that started, take a ladle of the pasta water after it's been boiling in the pasta, add it to the tomato sauce just to keep it moist, right? Because you, you'll see it might start to look a little bit uh, dry. Not dry, but needs a little bit of help. Now, when the pasta is ready, using a set of tongs, take the pasta out of the pot and put it right in with the tomatoes, right? You want to toss the pasta with the tomatoes so it's nice and coated. At this point, you might have to add two or three more ladles of the pasta water just to help it emulsify and remain moist, right? Remember, you don't want it wet. You just want it moist. Now, take it and serve it on warm plates and immediately bring it to your guests. Make sure you have plenty of cheese on the table um, to add with this dish and then one, and add the cheese while it's still nice and hot. Oh my God, it's so delicious. The cheese just kind of melts in there. It kind of gets creamy, cheesy. Oh, delicious. Enjoy this with uh, your favorite white wine. You know, you can drink a, 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 like a Chianti, a light red if you want. I prefer this with, uh, with my favorite chilled white wine. And you know what that is? Pinot Grigio Santa Margarita. In any event, uh, we are counting down till 8.30. And then tomorrow, don't forget, is the PPI. So two very important days. So until the sun comes up, and it's just about coming up now, until tomorrow, take good care.